Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Taji. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts here at Wesleyan, and I want to welcome you to the opening uh, events of our Luc Dubois in real time. This is the opening exhibition of the Zilka Gallery this year. Um, there are many people to thank who uh, brought us to this moment. Um, I want to in particularly uh, point out Anya Backland, who's our new exhibitions coordinator, who really was dedicated to every aspect of this exhibition. If you could give her a big round of applause, please. Where is she? I know where she is. I also uh, want to thank uh, John Elmore for the exhibition design, Tony Hernandez, our technical associate, for all of his work to make the installation happen, and the many gallery installers who came through to work on this, uh, this beautiful exhibition. Uh, it actually took a village. It took 11 departments to make this exhibition happen, and I'm so delighted that um, the ideas and the uh, thinking in this exhibition resonated across the campus. Forgive me, but I'm going to read them fast. Art and art history, government, mathematics and computer science, the music department, the digital and computational knowledge initiative, informational technology services, the office of academic affairs, the quantitative analysis center, the institute for curatorial practice and performance, and the Wesleyan Media Project. Would you give them a round of applause, please? Thanks. And then finally, I want to welcome a new uh, media sponsor of the CFA, Artscope Magazine. It's a new publication that focuses on the visual arts in New England, so we're delighted to have their new co-sponsorship. So, I met Luc Dubois um, uh, about 18 months ago when we served as panelists in a symposium entitled Genre Creates Ghetto, Curating in a Post-Genre World. He was on an artist panel and it became clear to me right away that this was a genre-defying artist. He is a, a, a composition PhD from Columbia. He is a renowned visual artist. Two weeks ago, I was at the National Portrait Gallery. He has uh, two major portraits, one of Britney Spears and one of the two co-founders of Google on, on display there right now. He is, also runs a, a major interdisciplinary uh, in engineering media center at NYU. And at a time when many departments on campus are thinking about how to encourage the digital and computational competency of our students, uh, it seemed to make sense that we should not only have Luke come here, but we should have him stay a while. And it's at that moment that um, we partnered with the music department and Ron Quivela, its chair, to think about how we might integrate an exhibition at Zilka into the music department uh, curriculum over the course of the fall. So, with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we created the first ever Creative Campus Fellow in Music, building on the fellows we've had in dance. And Aaron Roos Brown is coordinating um, not only uh, integration with the music department, but with a number of departments across the campus who are including Luke's exhibition uh, in, in their uh, curriculum this fall. So um, what that means in terms of Luke's residency is that uh, he will um, be conducting a number of workshops for music students on Saturdays. Uh, he'll be going into classes, and I just hope that everyone here will take advantage of his presence on campus in any way that you can think of, and you can contact Aaron to try to research that. We also will be having a series of conversations where some of the ideas brought about in the exhibition will be fleshed out by thinkers in other disciplines. So the first is on October 1st. It's with Sarah Hendren. The full listing is on our website. But to, to shepherd this exhibition to Wesleyan, we needed a guest curator. And I'm delighted now to introduce Lauren Rosati, who uh, is, was selected for her history and knowledge of Luke's work. And I hope you'll all get a chance to see our catalog uh, that has a beautiful essay that um, Lauren's written uh, uh, on, uh, on the occasion of the exhibition. So uh, Lauren is currently the Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow in Performance at the Whitney Museum. She was previously the Mellon Fellow at the Museum of Modern Art, Assistant Curator at the National Academy Museum, and the Assistant Curator at Exit Art. Her interests include global, modern, and contemporary art with a special focus on sound, media, performance, and conceptual practices. She's published essays in Performa and in uh, Alternative Histories New York Art Spaces. 
Uh, she received her BA in Arts in Context from the New School, her MPhil in Art History from the uh, CUNY Graduate Center, and she's currently pursuing a PhD in Art History at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, CUNY, where she's writing a dissertation on sound technologies and the European avant-garde between the wars. So with that, please welcome Lauren Rosati. Hey, thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to students, to parents, to alumni, uh, faculty, and guests. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, we've worked really hard to bring this exhibition to you over the last eight or so months, so we're excited for you to see it. Um, as Pam mentioned, thank you for the introduction. I'm Lauren Rosati. I'm the guest curator of this exhibition, which is the first major gallery presentation of Luke's work. Um, and I would like to repeat some of the thanks that she said, but thank you can always be said twice. So I think that's okay. So thanks to Pam for inviting us to organize this exhibition and to Anya, the exhibition's coordinator, for all of her support throughout the planning and installation process. To Erin Roos Brown, uh, the campus and community engagement manager for organizing the details of Luke's appearance on campus. Uh, and to John Elmore for creating the graphic uh, identity for the show. Um, so as Pam mentioned, last year Luke had a solo uh, mid-career survey titled Now at the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida, which presented the full breadth of his work. And Pam saw that exhibition and thought that his exploration of music, data, and politics would be a perfect fit for the creative and politically engaged and intellectual community here at Wesleyan. I've known Luke for about 10 years as a friend, a, a collaborator, a curator, and a one-time roommate. Uh, and to me, the most interesting and successful projects of his are those that use data. Um, as their basis. So given that Luke had just received this major retrospective, I wanted to focus on that aspect of his work in the show. So Luke calls and restructures real-time data, current statistics, and contemporary media footage to create artworks that visualize the zeros and ones of information. You have a taste of it here. He exchanges, erases, duplicates, downloads, and analyzes images, text, and data to create large-scale prints, multi-channel videos, and maps that explore subjects as diverse as the Iraq War, the US Electoral College, presidential speeches, and the census. Some of these projects, which you'll see shortly, include Hindsight is Always 2020, which you can actually see from the um, parking lot outside the gallery, which are a series of light boxes that visualize presidential State of the Union addresses as eye charts arranged according to frequency of word usage. You'll also see a more perfect union uh, for which Luke downloaded more than 19 million online dating profiles, harvested more than 20,000 unique words that people use to describe themselves, and then used these words to redraw maps of each state based on the most common descriptions. Luke will tell you more about those and other works in the show and, and not uh, in his talk. So I should mention too that almost everything in the exhibition was produced anew for this show. Everything you see was, re was remade. Uh, and in addition to recent projects created over the last few years, the exhibition includes two commissioned entirely new pieces and two works produced in entirely new formats just for Wesleyan. And if Luke's work is rooted in data, I think of this exhibition and its ancillary programming as a database of sorts where you, the public, can access information on his projects and concerns. Um, and to that end, in addition to the beautiful printed uh, catalog that's available in the gallery, we've also created an expanded uh, digital catalog online, which includes links to uh, data sets and images that aren't available in the show. Uh, and as Pam mentioned, there are also several public events happening throughout the fall in connection with the exhibition that will extend the reach of it throughout the campus. Um, so now I have the pleasure of introducing my friend, uh, the artist Luc Dubois, whose resume will make you feel really bad about yourself. Um, he, he is a composer and a performer who holds a doctorate in music composition from Columbia University. He is a software engineer who's the co-author of the software suite Jitter. He's a musician who appears on nearly 25 music albums, both individually and as part of the electronic group, the Freight Elevator Quartet. He's a professor who's the director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center at the NYU Polytechnic School of Engineering, where he runs the Ability Lab, a research center for client-centered design on populations with disabilities. And importantly, he's also an artist who has exhibited at the Democratic National Convention, the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, the Smithsonian Museum of Art, the Sundance Film Festival, and museums in Korea, Spain, and the United States. And soon, I imagine, he'll take over the world. So please join me in welcoming the inimitable Luke Dubois. Thank you. 
<laughs> Hi, everybody. You guys can all hear me? OK, amazing. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren and I are old buddies. And this has really been a fantastic journey to have her living inside my brain for a while. Um, and I can't thank you enough, Pam, and all of your staff. And y'all are lucky, um, so lucky, um, folks in the Wesleyan community to have such an amazing center for the arts here. Just, it's great. I can't even tell you how great it is. And I'm really um, just blessed to be here. It's going to be really fun to hang out with y'all this fall, hang out with my buddy Ron. Um, and everybody in the music department, and uh, thanks for having me around. I'm going to um, just give you a quick uh, little tour of some things I've got kicking around in my computer. Some of the things are in the show, some of the things I'm going to show you are not in the show, and then some of the things that are in the show I am not going to show you because I want you to walk over there and see them yourselves. Um, the thing you walked into um, is a little bit of a precy of... Uh, a little bit about how I think about art. So um, I make portraits. Um, they're just kind of weird portraits. So instead of being um, oil paintings of heroic men on horseback, they are things like this. Um, Y'all ever seen this movie, Desperately Seeking Susan? It's a good movie. It's an 80s movie. Madonna's in it. Right? So, so Desperately Seeking Susan is, a, is, a, is, is about multiple people pursuing someone through an activity that used to transpire on the back page of the Village Voice, but which now transpires on Craigslist. And it's called misconnections, the idea of, of, of putting an ad in a public forum to try to find someone. So this is a piece I did a couple of Valentine's days ago. And um, it works on the Craigslist misconnections feed. And you can, you can point it at any town in the, in the country. This is looking at New York. And you guys probably know what this is, but it's, it's that sort of thing where, you know, you encounter someone, you have a romantic encounter, and then you never see, you, you, you forget to kind of like, you forget to like make a follow-up. You forget to like get their name, get their number, figure out how to see them again. So you put this like, you kind of do this message in a bottle posting, and you're like, you were on the F train, you were wearing blue, I can't couldn't keep my eyes off you, whatever, right? So I have this theory that people uh, who put ads on this thing don't necessarily check to see if the other person also put ads on that thing, right? So I created this kind of public service piece that downloads all of your mis all the misconnections data in your city. And what it does is it goes through everything, looks at, just randomly picks ads, matches them up, does semantic analysis, and estimates the percentage chance that these two people were looking for one another. And then if it goes above 85%, it emails them and puts them in touch. Okay? And so I run this at night, right? Like a screensaver, right? So I run this while I sleep, and it puts hundreds and hundreds of people in touch all over the place. I have no idea if it freaking works, right? Because I don't actually pay attention to the email coming back at me. But, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of idea, right? And I think of this as a portrait, right? I think of this as a portrait of, you know, singles in New York trying to find one another. People, people, people who are lonely, right? And uh, something I think about, right? Um, I'm going to rewind a little bit and show you a uh, couple of old things. Let's get rid of this damn thing. Um, so, um, like everybody said, I, I started out as a musician. Um, and the way this whole thing happened, the first thing I need to tell you is, um, is so I first thing that happened to me was I flunked out of engineering school, um, which is ironic because I now teach at one. Um, and I flunked out of, I flunked out of engineering school um, because I fell in love with a machine. Um, and the machine was called the RCA Mark II synthesizer. Um, and it lived on 125th Street, sort of by Columbia University. Big thing. Um, kind of looks like this. Um, that's a bigger photo. Let's look at that for a sec. So it's a big machine. It was developed um, in the late 1950s as a, as a machine for making sound. It made four notes at once. One, two, three, four. Um, sort of vacuum tube. You would drive it with a paper tape kind of machine, kind of like a player piano, and it would write you a shellac record. It had a record lathe over here. It would cut you a record. And then you'd go into another room and listen to it, and realize you messed up, redo your paper tape. If you actually know anything about real-time computing, you realize this workflow is completely stupid, but just go with me. Um, and like you would listen to your record and do all this stuff. Um, so I got some sound off of it, and I was doing all this stuff. And I, and I started um, performing and um, working with... Um, 
synthesizers, not quite that old, but of a similar pedigree. Um, and, I, and I made a band in the 90s, and this is our band. It's called the Freight Elevator Quartet. And um, that's me in 1999 at the kitchen. Um, we had a cellist. We had a guy who played a didgeridoo. Um, we had a guy who played a bunch of um, contemporary digital drum machines. And then I would play these um, analog patch-based synthesizers from the 1960s and 70s. Maybe they had names like Buchla and Surge. Um, and eventually I sort of gave up because um, I was having trouble using them stably on the road. Um, the most particular thing that happened was I remember like playing a gig once where depending on whether the light switch was on in the women's room, very specific, um, all, my whole rig would sort of drop like a really unfortunate musical interval, like something like a minor ninth. So like I would be playing and it'd be like do 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 and someone would have to go pee and they would be like -na 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 -na. so that's a bummer. So I switched to a computer, um, which allowed us to do some things. And one of the things it allowed us to do was address our primary critique of the performance, which is that we were really boring to watch. And so what we did was we started figuring out a way to integrate video, live video, into the performance. So if you sort of like look downstage at this, I don't use PowerPoint, sorry. Um, uh, you know, you sort of that's less dynamic than whatever the hell is going on up here. So what we did was we, um, we took a bunch of uh, uh, video cameras, um, wireless video cameras, and we embedded them in um, Nerf footballs, because that makes sense. And, um, and then what we would do is um, we would embed them in the Nerf footballs, and then we'd like, you know, pass them out to the audience, and then project them behind us. And this is what it sort of came out looking like, okay? Um, and so, I don't know if you guys can tell, but this is listening to me, it's reacting to my voice. Hello, right? Um, and what it is, is it's a visualization of sound, right? This, this little guy up here, this is a um, little like kind of spectrum analyzer. It's basically that thing on your car stereo, it's bouncing up and down, you all know what I'm talking about, right? And you're like really high late at night, you're like, that's the guitar, that one, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? That thing, right? So that's that thing, right? So these are like low frequencies and these are like high frequencies. And all it is, it's a very simple visualization. All it's doing is it's, it's got my image in kind of like a little bit of memory, about 10 seconds of it. And if it's really loud, you see now. And if it's really quiet, you see 10 seconds ago. That's all there is to it, right? And so what this allows you, this proves a couple things, right? This proves that what's happening on stage is actually happening somewhat dynamically in real time because there's a video that's happening right now that's showing up, right? And it allows the audience to get engaged. And this is a problem that happens a lot when performing with technology that, that you know, comes up often in, um, you know, sort of work like the work that we do these days where we play with computers. I have a lot of text edit documents open. Um, so like, you know, playing with um, computers is kind of a double-edged sword, right? So there's two, there's two real big challenges, right? So one of them is, is this thing I call the transparency opacity problem, right? You see somebody on stage with a computer. And in a way, it's completely transparent because you also own a computer, right? So you're in the audience, you're watching somebody perform with a computer, you see art done with a computer. This also happens a little bit in visual arts. And you're like, yeah, okay, I, I got it. Like, I got a computer. So it's kind of transparent. It also causes interactivity envy because like, you see someone on stage with a laptop and you're like, wait a minute, I have a laptop. How come I'm not the person on stage, right? But it's also quite opaque because unlike a uh, kind of traditional musical instrument, the interface is very fungible on a computer. A computer can kind of do whatever you want, right? Um, it's got a mouse and a keyboard, but other than that, it's a kind of general purpose machine. So it's also quite opaque. Another way of putting this in um, kind of more pretentious language, um, since we're at a university, is to translate all this into French and talk about aesthetics, right? So jouissance and plaisir are two words in French that um, roughly cognate to joy and pleasure in English. They're a bit more nuanced than that. If you, if, you, if you actually speak French natively, you'll always know the difference between something that would be categorized as one or another. Uh, performance artist Coco Fusco described it best to me once where she said that um, something that's like an example of plaisir would be a really nice car. Jouissance would be having sex in the back of a really nice car, right? If you have those things backwards, you have a fetish, right? That's a working definition of a fetish, right? If you need the car more than you need the person, right? So that's a very specific thing, right? So Computing and electricity is really in our society a plaisir item, right? Unlike my buddy Alex, who I just saw walking as a cellist, right? Like, like his instrument is meant to be a jouissance item, 
my laptop is meant to help me do my taxes, right? No matter what kind of Apple advertising is, is issued to the contrary, right? This thing is really a very quotidian object. It's not important, right? Um, and it's not custom made for making art, right? So that's like the hurdle, right? That's a hurdle you gotta get over. And so when I started working, a lot of what I was doing was looking at ways in which you could use a computer to, to, to make things or experience things that you can't quite get to um, in other ways. So I'm gonna just show you, I'm just gonna rock through a couple things. So one of the first things I figured out um, pretty quickly is you know how to turn a sound into an image or something like that. Um, I'm gonna just do this for you right now by talking into my computer. This is something I do all the time, so just forgive me. My dog has fleas, testing one, two, three. Hey, that looks great. Fleas, testing one, two, three. That's great, look at that. My dog has fleas, testing one, two, three. All right, shut up. Okay, um, so this is a sonogram. This is a visualization of my voice. This is a pretty normal way to turn a sound into an image. The red line's time. Um, these are low frequencies. These are high frequencies. It's in 3D, so like the height of the mountains is like how loud a frequency is at that point in time. Kind of makes sense to you guys, right? It's kind of plot. Um, the dirty little secret with this piece of software, though, is it didn't actually record my voice. What it did was it turned into an image of sorts. And so when I play it back, what it's doing is it's scanning the image to reconstitute the sound. And so you can do all sorts of things you're not supposed to be able to do with a sound. Like, my dog has fleas. Like I can freeze time. Red line doesn't have to move. I can move at any speed I want. Testing one. Or I can play it backwards. No, it's a C. Right? Or I can play it really fast. Like a thousand times a second, like an oscillator. Or I can say, you know what? It's a picture. Why don't I put an effect on it? Like I blur it. Right? Right? We blur, we blur images all the time, right? You do that in Photoshop, so why wouldn't you blur a sound? So I'm thinking to myself, okay, what the hell am I gonna do with this? Um, and so I'm thinking like, you know, I gotta figure out a way to make something that's kind of interesting. And so uh, one thought in the vein of the, the red line can move at any speed would be this. You take every number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 since 1958 and you speed it up. So it lasts for one second for every week it's a number one, right? So this way, um, it normally lives on an old school iPad, iPod. Um, so this way you can listen to the whole history of the pop chart in the United States in 50, 37 minutes, about 37 minutes. Because really, you know, nowadays, you know, who the hell has time to listen to three weeks of music, right? So this is sort of how you do it. Um, you're gonna hear a chipmunk song, right? Um, some of these things are pretty interesting, like all of 1978's in the key of F pretty much. Um, that's because the guys from the Bee Gees could basically only sing one note. Um, but if you grow up listening to pop music, right, you have part of this memorized. This is your own personal cultural canon, right? You can be like, I love that song. I hated that song. I lost my virginity right there, whatever, right? You have, this is like part of, it's part of the American cultural canon. And I thought it would be interesting to look at how you can accelerate media, media right, to elucidate that and what kind of stories you can tell from it. So this is a project I did for the Sundance Film Festival, same idea, 2007. This is every Academy Award Best Picture sped up to one minute, okay? So this is 75 movies in 75 minutes. This is a totally unwatchable film. Um, this is Wings. I'm gonna fast forward to something you might actually recognize. Do, 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 Oh, that looked good. That's Casablanca, right? And the whole movie is in here. I'm not skipping through the movie. I'm doing a high resolution average of the entire film. So, um, so the whole damn thing's in there, sound and all. Um, and you can tell, it still kind of looks like Casablanca, right? Rick still looks like Rick. Ilsa still looks like Ilsa. Paris still looks like Paris. Blah, blah, blah. If you go up to a movie that's a little bit more contemporary, the, the, the editing style really starts to inform something. So it's Chicago. And Chicago's louder and brighter, but it's also um, harder to read. They're the same length film, so they're being sped up the same amount. So what that's telling you about is that's telling you about the editing style. The average length of a cinematic shot in the 1940s was about 30 seconds. Now it's about six seconds, right? We cut our movies like music videos, right? Um, so we've acquired this cultural ADD. And then to round out the piece, I, I made this piece um, uh, 
you know, where I took all the Playboy Playmates and centered their eyes. This is 50 years of Playboy in 50 seconds. Right? So this is time-lapse pornography. Right? Um, and so this is kind of a history of airbrushing. Um, if this were a different class, we could have a really interesting conversation right now about the heteronormative male gaze. Right? So this is, the, but this is part of a trio of pieces about American cultural canvas shush, um, and sort of democratic process. So because the, the thing about these three film, these three pieces is um, when you get a number one song or you get an Oscar or you become a Playmate of the Month, you get on a list. It's kind of like the guest list to eternity. By eternity, I mean until we stop being a country and caring about these things. But, um, but the point is, the ways in which one gets on those lists are kind of interesting. To get an Academy Award for Best Picture, right, um, the people who vote for the Academy Awards for Best Picture are the people who are themselves eligible to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, right? It's a peer review, right? We never voted for Casablanca, right? A bunch of directors and actors did. Um, to get a number one song, right, you need the collusion of several major multinational corporations. Don't get me started about Playboy, but you sort of get the idea, right? This is not necessarily a democratic process by which we select this media, yet somehow we value it in a democratic society. So I'm sort of interested in like riffing on that. Um, one of the pieces that's in the show, which I did as kind of a follow-up to this, was to sort of explore that things about American portraiture through text. And so this was a commission, and there's a beautiful recreation of a bunch of these in the gallery um, that I really want you all to see. Um, this was a commission for the 2008 Democratic National Convention. Um, it was part of a show called Dialogue City that was in Denver during the DNC in 2008. Um, curator was a guy named Seth Goldenberg. Um, this was the first big piece I did, um, per first big public work I did. And, um, and, and this was a real hard one to do. I was sort of stalled out on this one, honestly. Because what had happened was um, they wanted me to do something about, like, pr about, like political rhetoric. Political rhetoric. And so what I did was I found this place at UC Santa Barbara called the American Presidency Project. There was this kind of, what, what we would now term a digital humanities archive. It was a bunch of people taking every single speech from every president all the way back to George Washington, the entire paper trail of the American presidency, basically, and sticking it into a computer database for social science research. So I kind of rolled up in the piece and said I was going to be their artist in residence. I just showed up. I booked myself a gig with my buddy Todd Reynolds in Santa Barbara and just showed up. Um, and this is in 2000, early 2007. And um, they kind of didn't know what to do with me, so they humored me for a while. Um, and I hung out. And I, was, and I was doing things like I was making like top, like a Billboard Hot 100 list of things presidents say all the time. Like, God bless America. I'm not a crook, whatever, right? And, um, and then I was stuck and I was, I was, on t I was watching TV. I, haven't, I, I don't sleep very much. I was watching TV. Um, and uh, you all remember the show Crossfire on CNN, right? This is a show that Jon Stewart sort of helped cancel, right? Because it's garbage, right? It's sort of two assholes from the American left yelling at two assholes from the American right for an hour, right? So one of the assholes on the American left is this fellow named James Carville. He's best known for saying it's the economy stupid, right? He was Bill Clinton's domestic policy advisor. And he was there. And he was talking about George W. Bush, who was president at the time, and he was using the word vision over and over again. He was saying, the problem with him is he doesn't have any vision, 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 vision. And so it's three in the morning in Santa Barbara, and I'm in like a Motel 6 eating Doritos in my underwear watching the rerun. And I'm like, vision, yeah, that's right. That's a term you use, right, to talk about leaders. In hindsight, how do you test vision? You make eye charts, right? So these are eye charts. And there's one for every president of the United States. And it's something called the TFIDF, which is a pretty common statistical process for corporate corpus analysis and text. So what it is, is it's the 66 words in their State of the Union addresses that they use more than any other president. So George Washington's number one word is gentleman, right? George Bush, who was president at the time, his number one word is terror, right? Um, Bill Clinton spent most of his presidency talking about the century in which he would no longer be president, but maybe his wife will. Right? Um, let's see what else we got. Ronald Reagan is deficits. Right? Makes sense. Richard Nixon, amazingly, is truly, which makes sense. Right? His uh, speechwriter, man named William Sapphire, very smart guy. He did word counts. Right? He understood the rhetoric that he was trying to portray with his boss. Lyndon Johnson um, was the first president to give all, give all his speeches on primetime television. 
his speechwriters had him begin every paragraph with the word tonight, otherwise it would have been Vietnam, right? Um, uh, some of these you can sort of guess, right? Abraham Lincoln is emancipation. He's in here somewhere, here we go. FDR is democratic, right? Herbert Hoover is unemployment, right? Calvin Coolidge, this is the last time New Orleans flooded, right? So what do you do with this? So you make these light boxes, big light boxes, um, and they're to scale. Uh, so if you can stand 20 feet back and you can read between those lines, you have 20-20 vision. All right, they're to scale. Um, and we installed them outside the DNC. Um, we also made a print series that we installed in a protest show at the RNC um, called the Unconvention. So this is at the Weissman Art Museum in Minneapolis. This was curated by Steve Dietz. And this was a pretty fun show. These were large format letterpress. And they've been touring, they've been crisscrossing the country ever since. Right? And so this project is about you know, making a portrait of the United States through the political rhetoric of the presidency, right? which is a very specific lens. And so I had to make a sequel because this is very incomplete, right? Um, this, is not, this is not us. This is sort of the boss. He's not really the boss, which is part of the reason why I made this. Um, the State of the Union actually is really about establishing the subordinate power relationship of the executive branch to Congress, right? It's the president's homework assignment, right? Because, because the president is not sovereign in this country, the Congress is, right? You know, Nancy Pelosi, at the time I was making this, was technically George W. Bush's boss, right? She could have fired him. He couldn't have touched her, right? And that was something people had forgotten at that moment. So that's why I sort of made this about the State of the Union addresses. But I thought I'd make a sequel. And um, I'll riff through this really fast. Um, so what I did was uh, I did this kind of little experiment where... Um, I started um, looking at how people talk in um, online dating services. Online dating services. And, uh, and this kind of got out of control. Um, what happened was, this got really out of control. Um, what happened was um, some friends of mine made me a Match.com profile. Um, I'll explain why in a minute, you'll see. But, but, but it made me this Match.com profile. And then I got kind of obsessed with writing the profile. You know, thing you got to do. You don't have to do this anymore because now there's, this is, so this is back in 2010, right? So there's no Tinder. OkCupid has just launched. Most dating services are still owned by the IAC properties, like Barry Diller's company. So they're Match.com, stuff like that. Um, so uh, what happened was I got obsessed with writing the profile. I got obsessed with, like, trying to figure out how this all worked. So I started joining them from different perspectives in different places. And before I knew it, I joined 21 different online dating sites as a straight man, a gay man, a straight woman, a gay woman in every zip code in America. And I downloaded 19 million people. Um, to a hard drive, and, uh, and I decided to make a census. Um, and so what's cool about this, there's, there's some easy things you can do, right? Like I can, I, can, I can tell you where all the funny people are, right? So Nebraska is not very funny, right? I can tell you where all the lonely people are. They tend to be in the upper, upper Appalachia, right? The shy people are in the upper Midwest. Um, this is telling you that all the, the uh, women in Alaska should get together with the men in southern New Mexico and have a good time. This is a kinky map. <laughs> Right. And I've got it pretty specific, right? So I can tell you that, like, you know, men in the eastern half of Long Island are way more interested in being spanked than men in the western half of Long Island, right? Um, I think Congress needs to know this information. I think this is vital to our national security. So I did this census, right? And so what I did um, was, uh, was I, I, I took a Rand McNally trucker atlas and scanned it in the computer and hand drew, drew it. And I replaced the name of every single city in the United States with the word people use more in that city than anywhere else in the country in their dating profiles. So something like 30,000 unique words. So if you've ever dated anyone from Seattle, this makes perfect sense, <laughs> okay? So we got heartbreak, right? Pretty, they're in a fucking band. They smoke, right? Um, whatever. This is Redmond, Washington, which is the headquarters of Microsoft. Their number one word is email, um, right? Like, uh, you know, some of these you can kind of guess, right? So like, you know, um, San Francisco's gay. Do, 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 do. Los Angeles is acting. Um, New York City's number one word is now. As in now I am working as a waiter, but actually I'm an actor. Um, but some of these are kind of fun. So like this is Syracuse, New York. Um, Syracuse, New York number one word is dinosaur. I know this for a fact because the only place to eat in Syracuse, New York that will not kill you is a Hells Angels barbecue joint called Dinosaur Barbecue. So that's where you take someone on a date Right? Um, right? So there's a lot of dating stuff in here, right? As makes sense. I can go down to the zip code level. 
zip code level. Um, so like I live, where do I live? I live somewhere between unconditional and midsummer, right, in midtown. Um, if you know New York City at all, you know, this is sort of the, uh, this is sort of the Williamsburg Greenpoint area. So we got electro, pleasure, noise, narcissistic, DJ, aimlessly, web, urbane, hipsters, you get the idea, right? So the project's called A More Perfect Union, right? And the idea was, you know, what if we could redefine this whole red state, blue state, Michigas, right? To be not necessarily about the political um, tensions of the moral panics of the day, but what if we could do it based on, you know, what if we had political parties based on what we want to do on a Friday night, right? So the Democrats against the Republicans, what if it's the introverts against the extroverts? People who want to stay in and watch Netflix, right? Against the people who want to go out dancing, right? What would that look like, right? How, 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 what's our identity happen when we put it into that matrix, right? And so it's sort of, sort of thinking about that and thinking about the rhetoric around that. And then to kind of round it out, um, I did a couple pieces more recently that are self-portraits, right? And these self-portraits are kind of fun. They're both in the gallery. I'll just show you this one right now. This is all my email. Um, since 1993, I've sent, I've sent and received about half a million emails. Um, and this is, um, this is something called a force-directed graph, which is all the latest and greatest in um, data visualization right now because you can be lazy and you don't have to label the axes. Um, it's all based on physics. And so what you got to imagine is there's a big bang in the center with everybody I know in the middle of it, right? And what happens is um, everybody flies out at a random um, heading, and everybody's got gravity um, based on uh, a few things, but gravity to each other. And it's based on things like how long have we been emailing, how much have we been emailing, uh, who you're carbon copied with. It also does... Um, single axis sentiment analysis. So if I say I love you, you're heavier to me, right? And they handwrite all the names, right? Don't try this at home, it's drag. Um, but, uh, but it gives you this kind of sense of like, you know, this is, this is me. This is me and my electronic communications. This is what the, the NSA thinks I am, right? This is, this is what they know about me. There's a sequel, the other thing the NSA knows about me is this, which is my Facebook, right? My social media activity. But this is actually my under the hood email, right? So I got everybody. I got, you know, I got my gallery. I got all the artists I work for. I got Lauren right here, right? Um, you know, the thickness of the line is how much we've been emailing. Up in the corners are, you know, people I don't talk to all that much, right? So in the upper left are all the um, people I worked with at a software company in San Francisco for about 10 years. Up here are all the nameless, faceless apparatchiks at my university who I'm carbon copied on emails on constantly but have never actually met. Um, so you sort of get a sense of like the universe, right? It's sort of a self-portrait. Um, not everything I do is um, quite in that kind of works on paper thing. Um, so I do a lot of film. I just want to show you a couple more things and try to like blast through it really fast. Um, I also do a lot of things with um, music and cinema and time and portraiture and looking at the relationship between Yikes. Looking at the relationship between the performing arts and the recording arts and that tension. This is a project I did in 2007 um, called Fashion Laid for the Relationship. This is a film. Um, this is a part collaboration with a performance artist. Her name is Leon Cifuentes. Um, she spent 72 hours on a traffic island with me in 2007 on 4th of July weekend getting ready for a date in slow motion. Um, and then I filmed it panoptically and sped it up to 60 speed. So it's a 72-hour performance collapsed into a 72-minute movie where everything that she did in the performance that took an hour takes a minute in the film. Everything that took a minute in the performance takes a second in the film, okay? Um, and so there are all these things that mark time on the set. There's a clock. She's wearing a watch. There's flowers that wilt. There's fruit that rots. All that kind of stuff. The, the um, street lights are a heartbeat. Right? It was open to the public, it's a living diorama performance. It's just unless you stick around long enough, you disappear in the film, right? you ghost away. Um, and she does her stuff, right? She uh, eats some food, right? She writes in her diary. Later on, um, she smokes a cigarette and talks on the phone, right? She uh, um, does her nails, takes about four hours to do the nails on one hand. 
She spent 16 hours picking out a dress. Um, anything she couldn't do slowly, so she's moving really slowly right now. Um, anything she couldn't do sm slowly, she did repetitively, right? So um, when she smokes, she smokes like 15 cigarettes in a row. Take up the time, right? Because you got to take up the time. Um, and uh, eventually, that always grosses people out. It's kind of funny. Um, and eventually she puts on this kind of seven-year itch number and goes off and has a cat, right? And that's the end, right? And so this is an unwatchable performance. Except for me, her, and the director of photography, nobody saw the whole thing, right? People drop by. We're on the front page of the New York Times the third day. This is actually a nice thing for people who are in, into the arts in this room who are going to try this after you leave this school. Um, you can do anything in New York City if you have a film permit. Straight up. Don't try to get a theater per permit. Don't even fucking bother. Right? Just call the mayor's office of film and television, say you need a film permit, they'll give it to you. Um, so we had a four-day film permit for Union Square, and we just did this piece. Right? Um, the fact that we were filming it was sort of beside the point at the moment. Right? Um, so this is, this is good stuff. Right? Um, and so another unwatchable piece would be uh, the sequel. This is a project I did in New Orleans. I'll show you another one in a sec. Um, this is 350 high school marching band musicians. And what I did was I split them up into five teams um, and had them do a five-part parade converging on a park. Uh, but there was a little trick. In the corner of the park was a house. On the top of the house, I put a radio tower. And then I broadcast a click track to all the drum majors. So even though they started out a mile apart, they all converged in sync. So another unwatchable performance, right? You could sit in the park and hear people come in one at a time. Right? Right? Or you could follow one of the bands, like a second line, and only see a fifth of the performance. Right? So this was done as a way to kind of look at the streets of New Orleans, right? And look at the marching band culture in this kind of panoptic way. And this was done as a, as a um, cultural placemaking project. So this is the opening ceremonies for the Prospect 2 Art Biennial. And this is to raise money um, for the middle school kids in the film who are um, a group called The Roots of Music, which is a nonprofit for at-risk at -risk youth in New Orleans to get into the marching bands. Um, so this was a big, crazy film shoot. And then there are these classical versions. And, there, and I want to show you this because there's a thing like it, a little bit like it in the gallery. Same idea, right? This is the other way around. So this is, um, this is called vertical music. Um, this is um, a group called Tactus. They're the contemporary music ensemble at the Manhattan School of Music in New York. It's a couple years old, four years old. Um, and this is a four-minute piece of music that was filmed at 240 frames a second. So it's playing back at one-tenth speed. So it lasts 40 minutes, right? It's the other way around. So instead of speeding up, you're slowing down. You see things like strings vibrate, and vibrato becomes microtonal, and acoustic space expands. I filmed this in my apartment. It sounds like a church. Right? It's an old Motown trick. They used to record Diana Ross on the tape. They'd play her at the top of the stairwell, record her at the bottom, and they play her too fast, so she's like out with the chipmunks. Record her at the bottom, you slow it down, it sounds like she's in a cathedral. Right? Um, and it's a way to kind of look at musicians. And you'll see in the gallery, there's a whole series of portraits of some truly amazing experimental musicians from New York City who I've known over the years. And we did the same trick, right? Um, you know, so that's kind of that. Not everything is quite fun in games, so to round this out, um, there's a piece in the show called Hard Data um, that's also a data visualization. It's a little less fun. It's not really a data visualization, it's data sonification. This is a string quartet I wrote about the Iraq War. And so the way this works is um, there's a measure a day, and there's a movement for all the dead men and children dead soldiers, all the people who've been made refugees and all the people who've gone missing. And there's a measure a day, and if, you know, 20 people got killed that day, the string quartet gets to play 20 minutes. That's it. And each movement of the piece is, is scored in the style of a composer who wrote in the time of war. So there's a piece that sounds like Xenakis, there's a piece that sounds like Messe, and there's a piece that sounds like Stravinsky, etc., etc., etc. And this was something that I was sort of working on, that I've been working on kind of concurrently through this, around the idea of the politics of data visualization and how they have this real potential for anesthetization when used in public discourse, right? You guys have experienced this now. You see maps and graphs and bar charts 
on the cover of a newspaper now, on the front page, where, where once there was a photograph, right? And that could be a very anesthetizing thing. And the Iraq War was the first conflict in which more of us had data than knowledge. More of us had the numbers than knew anybody in it, right? And that's a heartbreaking scenario, right? I'll show you a sequel to this, and then we'll, 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 we'll take some questions. Um, this is a project in New Orleans, too. This is a good story. Um, this is a Walter PPK 9mm semi-automatic that was used in a shooting in the French Quarter in New Orleans last Valentine's Day in a dispute over parking. Um, this is right now living in Ferguson, Missouri. It just opened tonight, too. So that's what's happening uh, a couple time zones away. Uh, this is my house in New Orleans. Here's some barbecue I eat. Um, this is a hardware store I had to go to like 16 times to find the fucking hard-to-find drawer. <laughs> I was like... Y'all are amazing. Um, all right, so this is an Internet of Things piece. Have you ever heard this term, Internet of Things? Sometimes I call it connected devices. It's that thing where you like hit the snooze button on your alarm clock and your coffee maker goes off. There's usually no Internet and there's usually no thing. Um, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. So I got me a bike chain, I got me a motor, and I got me a little computer. Bike chain, little stepper motor, little computer. Um, drill a hole in the trigger. It's my buddy Cole. He's a welder. Um, you take the gun, you weld it to a base, um, you get attacked by a rooster, um, and then what you do is you stick the whole thing in a gallery, and this machine is living inside that box with a wire going up on the trigger, right? And then you put a nice little glass plexiglass case on it, and the computer is on the internet, and it is listening to the 911 feed of the New Orleans Police Department. And so anytime anyone gets shot in New Orleans, it fires. Right. Okay? Data visualization, right? You call this data visualization, right? So it's a blank. It's blank. So there's no bullet, but there's smoke and powder. And most importantly, there's a cartridge. And there are five shootings a day in this city, so this filled up with bullets over four months. 500 people, right? It's like a wishing well in reverse, right? And this is the kind of thing that they represent in the New York Times with a fucking bar graph, right? So this is the kind of thing you can do with art and technology and data. So thank you for your time. Let me know if you have any questions, okay? Do you want to grab the thing and we'll... So we have time for two or so questions before we go to the gallery. So if anybody has a question for... for, for me. Yeah. Talk to me, sir, in the back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, I have, I have, I have pretty um, amazing um, OCD. This may be obvious to you guys. Maybe I didn't need to say that. Um, and so one of the things, one of the ways that manifests itself is, is I, um, I tend to over-research, right? So when I Google something, I read the first like seven, eight, ten pages of results, right? Which is something that like I just kind of do out of a matter of course. And then I end up on these like ridiculous tangents at three in the morning where I started trying to find out a 24-hour printer, and then before I know it, I'm reading about the Third Crusade, and I'm like, how, ha, how did that happen, right? You know, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, we are obsessed with lists. We are obsessed with being the best. There's a, there's a part of American civil religion that sort of celebrates success by metrics that we don't, 
that are very that are kind of like alarmingly imprecise, right? Because a lot of them are about things like money, right? Um, and so, right? So by by a certain by a certain metric, right? This 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 gentleman who's running for president, Donald Trump, right, is 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 in a way the best, right? In a very specific frame of reference, right? You maybe don't want him to be president, but it is indisputable that he has succeeded at something. Um, and so that's the thing I'm always trying to problematize with these lists is like, you know, and, and Playboy is sort of the perfect example, right? There's this thing called the Westermark effect, right, in psychology, this idea that there, there's this kind of uncanny valley curve of our affinity for people based on how familiar they are from our youth, right? It's sort of, it's sort of that, it explains like the sort of Oedipus Electra complex, it explains why you marry the girl next door or whatever. And the injection of Playboy and the sort of cult of mediatized Southern California sort of 19, circa 1970s beauty into that equation completely fucks up basically everything about our relationship dynamics globally, right? You know, does that make sense to you? So like that's kind of like one of those things where it's almost like, it's almost like a butterfly effect, just as like one guy launching a magazine in 1958 created this rolling disaster that we never quite recovered from. It's unrecoverable at this point. Um, and a lot of it, and a lot of it is, is, is our mass media, you know, and, I, and, it, and, it, and it's one of those things that I think used to keep me up at night a lot more before I started going on this rant about data visualization, but as a practice, but it's, it, it is a thing, and I do think about it. Um, one of the things that was really fun about the dating project was that there's a flaw in the statistics in that piece, which is all those words got to be unique and not everywhere in the country has a lot of people doing online dating. So if there's a town in Iowa where there's only five single people and one of those single people really likes snowboarding, that means 20% of the town really likes snowboarding and they get the word, right? And that's a way to like tease out these kind of weird, you'll see it if you go over to the show, right? There, there's all these really weird things where you're like, how the hell is it that Nebraska City's number one word is Osaka? And it's like, because that's the good sushi restaurant, right? Like, that makes sense. But, like, you have to know. I don't know. I think, you know, we don't give ourselves enough credit for our rhetoric. I think it's more, we're more interesting than we think we are in terms of how we talk about ourselves given the opportunity. So that was part of it. Yeah. What else, y'all? I can't see anything. The idea with the, yeah, so the idea with the gun piece, the gun piece is called Take a Bullet for the City. And what it was doing was it was commemorating, so in 1994, right, Janet Reno, Clinton's Attorney General, mandated that um, every city with more than 100,000 people in it in the United States had to standardize her crime reporting. Right, this has never done, been done before. So 1994 was the first year where the sentence, the most dangerous city in the United States, dot, 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 had an answer that was based on kind of standard metrics, and the answer was New Orleans, right? And so all the local artists did this big show, big social practice show called Guns in the Hands of Artists, where they took all their guns and turned them into sculptures, right? And so this was like a commission for the 20th anniversary of that. So that's why I ended up with a physical gun. It's interesting, like it wouldn't have occurred to me to end up with a physical gun until that kind of landed in my lap. I was like, wait, you're actually gonna give me a real gun? And they were like, yeah, that's kind of the point, dude. And I was like, Okay. Um, never fired one before, sure. Um, so that's how I ended up with that. That's the 3D, that's how that happened, just so you understand. It wasn't, I don't want to delude you into thinking that I had this like whole idea like by my, from scratch. I was sort of given a gun as a material and I had to figure out what to do with it. And, um, and but, but what it really comes down to is the idea of, 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 of shock and awe with data, right, and how that relates to, my, my, my brother's a photographer, and he had a very long career in photojournalism as well. So um, I'm very sensitized to that whole, 
the picture tells a thousand words, right? Like Pulitzer winning photojournalism from war zones. This is the most effective way to tell the story, to supplement a story kind of thing. And so I'm predisposed to have this gripe about those people being laid off and replaced with infographics. But I'm also um, of the opinion that data, um, as opposed to maybe experience, can be like, you know, kind of telecommuted a little bit across long distances and be quite effective if it's done right. And so the thing I wanted to do was create kind of an alarm, right? I wanted to create sort of the opposite of the town crier, right? So instead of saying three o'clock and all is well, you get a fire, you get a gunshot, you have something that wakes you up. And it was originally supposed to be in, uh, in the open, like a public piece mm -hmm. in a, in outside. And the community board was like, you know, <laughs> not gonna let you do that, buddy. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, really? They're blanks. They were like, yeah, that's not the point. Um, you know, so, it's, it's, so it was a little bit like that. Like in an ideal world, they're outside. It's like an alarm, right? Um, the community affairs uh, folks in the New Orleans Police Department have been trying very hard to do minor interventions, some of them slightly subversive, to try to get people aware of the gun violence in their community and try to make it message to the tourists that keep the city going. So they did a thing at Jazz Fest last year where the sound guys had a police scanner, right? And any time there was a shooting, they would cut the board for 10 seconds, right? They would shut off the sound in the club, right? Um, to let everybody know that something happened, right? It might have been miles away. Um, but it was, it was so like stuff like that, stuff that like kind of hits you is something I was really thinking about. That's why I call these things hard data, right? They're hard like they're facts, but they're hard, they, but they hurt, right? Data can hurt, yeah. Um, anyway, that was a rambling answer, I'm sorry. I didn't even know if I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah right, was... so now I invite you all to go next door to see the show in person, and we can continue the conversation there. So thank you, and thanks, Luke. Thanks. Mm -hmm.